All right, well, I'd like to um, just read a few verses of Scripture, and um, we are getting the topic from these verses, but we're going to range through the Scriptures quite broadly, actually. But I'd like to read for you Mark 2, verses 23 through 28, and just to get Jesus' opinion on, on this day. <laughs> I don't know why it is that, um, I mean, very high-profile, respectable teachers, even in the Reformed camp, can look at passages like this, and somehow it just kind of escapes them. It, it seems when Jesus is teaching on other topics... Well, we need to listen to that because Jesus is giving us New Testament doctrine. He's giving us New Covenant doctrine. But when it comes to this, he's not. He's giving us Old Covenant doctrine that's going to pass away. I don't understand how they can make that distinction because Jesus doesn't make that distinction. Here he's telling us the character of the New Covenant. Okay? And it, it, because it's a continuance of really what's required in the Old Covenant, there's really no change except the ceremonial law is fulfilled and it's done away with. We don't have to keep it anymore. But the moral law remains the same. And in the new covenant, he gives us the power to keep it because he gives to us that love of the Spirit. So let me read the passage. So Mark 2, beginning in verse 23. And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of, Bi of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and he also gave it to those who were with him? Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So Jesus tells us the Sabbath was made for man. It's, it's meant to be a continued blessing. And I believe that example, the example he was giving here of um, uh, David and his companions eating the consecrated bread is simply to say that when God gives us a commandment, this is meant to be kept unless by keeping it, it threatens life or something more important might be, might be threatened, in which case love for the neighbor is, um, is what trumps. In this case, um, uh, the, uh, Jesus and his disciples were traveling, and when they're traveling, uh, they had the right to glean. I believe to, uh, not even to glean, but to eat from uh, a, um, the field of one of their countrymen, but only to eat what they need. They couldn't uh, go and harvest this crop for them and then carry it away, but they could eat what they needed when they were traveling, and they could do it on the Sabbath. Now, we know that this is one of the exceptions to no work, but the point I want to see here is that Jesus says the Sabbath continues. He says it was made for us. It was made to be a blessing to us, and he even declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. So, how can you be the Lord of something that doesn't exist? All right. So, anyway, let's uh, take a look at this tonight, beginning with um, just a review of this morning and why it is we're looking at this this evening. Remember this morning, Paul told us how we should handle our differences when it comes to matters of Christian liberty. When we disagree, we're not to judge each other. We're not to criticize and argue and write each other out of the kingdom because we don't agree or, you know, you don't agree with me, I don't agree with you. We still need to accept one another as brethren. Secondly, he said we're not to stumble each other. And again, we're talking here about matters of Christian liberty, food and drink and um, which days to keep and so forth. He says we're not to stumble each other by practicing the freedom that we have publicly or in front of somebody who disagrees with us, potentially tempting them, encouraging them to act against their conscience. If we do that, we're, we're putting them on a path that leads to destruction. And obviously, we want to love our neighbor. We don't want to injure them. So in conclusion, he said, we need to use our freedom to serve each other, set aside our own pleasure as Jesus did. Don't think about just what I want to do, but think about what's good for your neighbor. 
And for your brother and sister in Christ, serve them and bless them instead of just pleasuring yourself. That's what Jesus did. He gave up his pleasure. He went to the cross. He suffered and died so that we might be saved. Now, Paul did give us two examples, remember? Eating meats likely offered to idols or eating vegetables only. And that of holding certain days as special, the Jewish ceremonial feast days, or regarding every day the same. Now, we, we passed over that second point very quickly this morning, uh, but there's an issue that what Paul says here raises, and that issue is, is Paul saying here that the Sabbath has been done away with because this is one of the verses that's used to, to try to prove that point. The commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is Paul saying when one person regards every day the same, that we're free to do that. We can say every day is the same. I can treat the Sabbath the way I can treat any other day. Has it been abolished so that we no longer need to keep it? Well, we need to see that Jesus not only didn't abolish the day, as we've just read, but he reinforces it as something that is necessary for our spiritual well-being. Sabbath was made for man. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. We need to keep the Sabbath. I've been listening to a series um, <clears throat> that Ligonier's put out that, um, you know, it's a daily video. You still can gain access to it. It's about the history of the Presbyterian Church. <laughs> but it's, it's very interesting because he, he shows how we got to where we are today and um, in, in many different ways and why the church is as it is and so forth, but particularly how the Presbyterians came about. But he did in explaining Presbyterianism, talked about one Presbyterian minister in particular whose name was Ashbel Green. And that's a name, I'm not sure that I had ever heard of it before then. I might have, I'm not sure. Um, because I did have Bob Godfrey and, or Robert Godfrey in seminary. He might have mentioned him. But he was a Presbyterian minister in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And he wrote quite a bit about what was good for the nation. And one thing he wrote was that the Sabbath was one of the things that the Lord has given us. And by this, by us, I, I think he means the world, but he was speaking about the nation. To safeguard our happiness and our freedom, uh, the freedom of our nation as a whole. And what he meant by that as something that is necessary to maintain true Christianity which is good for the nation. And he's right. One of the reasons, one of the reasons why God's kingdom is as weak as it is today is that very few of God's people regard the Sabbath. And one of the reasons why that's happening, or two reasons, is because the flesh, you know, we still have to contend with it. And if there's a loophole for us to escape it, we tend to take it. And ministers are giving that loophole by teaching that the Sabbath is no longer binding. As I mentioned, they read the New Testament and they say that nine of the Ten Commandments are still enforced, but the Sabbath is nowhere enforced. Well, that isn't true. I just read a passage where Jesus quite plainly tells us that that is the case. So that's what we want to look at this evening because we're never really going to keep it as we should unless we're convinced that the Sabbath continues. So this evening, I want us to look at three things. First of all, that the Scripture tells us quite plainly the Sabbath does continue in the New Covenant. Secondly, I want us to look very briefly at how the Lord wants us to keep the day. But thirdly, and most importantly, why we need to keep it. I've already given you one reason of Ashbel Green, but it really has to do with our spiritual well-being. We need this day. The day was made for us because we need this day. So let's consider first that the Lord intended the Sabbath to continue into the new covenant, that Paul did not intend to include this day in the statement we read earlier in Romans 14. We need to be convinced of that, or we very likely will not keep it. So, okay, so first of all, we do need to remember when God established it and why he established it. He established it from the very beginning the beginning of the creation, to be a day of rest and worship for all mankind, to be that for us. Moses writes in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, 
By the seventh day, God completed His work, which He had done. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work, which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work, which God had created and made. Now the question is, what, what does He mean by this? Did God get tired and He needed to rest from the work of creation? Did it wear Him out? Well, no, He didn't rest because He was tired. And for the same reason, He didn't bless the day as a day of rest for Himself. Rather, we read when He gives the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai in Exodus 20 that He appointed this day to be a day of rest for us, okay? He set the pattern for us from the very beginning, working six days and resting on the seventh. He blessed it for, for us because when we work, we get tired. But He also gave it to us to be a day to worship. It was to be a picture of what was ahead of us, a picture of that eternal rest which is in heaven, okay, where we will worship Him forever. So from the very beginning, God held out to us a day that was meant to picture the eternal rest of heaven that we would eventually enter into by trusting in the Messiah. Now, I believe that Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath when they were in the garden. Okay, we don't see any explicit examples of that. But we have to assume that they did from the verses that we just read because Adam and Eve loved God with their whole heart and they wanted to worship their Creator and God had set this day apart for them to rest and worship. This is the day they must have loved more than any other day. I mean, if you had a choice between tending the garden or spending the day with God, what would you choose if you love God more than anything else? We know that they kept this day after the fall. Let's, let's not forget they fell, but God redeemed them. He gave them His Spirit, and they again loved Him, but not perfectly like they did before. But we read in Genesis 4, verses 3 and 4, So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. The question is, why did they do that? It's because they knew that's what they were supposed to do at this particular time frame. In the course of time, that's literally translated, the words that are translated are literally at the end of days. And what that means is at the end of the weekly cycle that God had established for work and rest, work six days and rest on the seventh or rest on the Sabbath. And let's not forget, the word Sabbath simply means rest. The Sabbath is the day of rest. And notice what they were doing on this day. They were bringing sacrifices to worship God because they understood this was how they were to approach Him. This was how they were to worship Him. God had showed them Himself how to approach Him when He killed the animals to make coverings for Adam and Eve's nakedness. He was showing them, again, a picture, a type of how one day their sins would be covered through the sacrifice of the seed of the woman that he had already promised to send. Now, we don't have any specific references to the patriarchs observing the day, but I think, again, we should assume that this day was kept up in the godly line as God's word was passed on through the godly line from generation to generation. They didn't have any written word but they had the oral tradition. Remember, it was Moses who first wrote, well, the first books of the Bible. And uh, Moses, you know, comes rather late in Old Testament history. So there was oral tradition. And, of course, by the help of the Holy Spirit, guiding him, keeping him free from error, he was able to put all that together and give to us the account that we have from the beginning to his, his time. Now, we know that the Jews lost the Sabbath when they went into Egypt because Pharaoh made them slaves and wanted them to work all the time to, to build his, his, um, you know, his cities, his treasure cities and his monuments of triumph and so forth. But when God finally brought them out, the first thing he did was he restored to them the Sabbath. We read in Exodus 16, 
Moses says, tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. He says that in verse 23, he says in verse 29, see the Lord has given you the Sabbath. And then we read in verse 30, so the people rested on the seventh day. And again, they rested that they might worship the Lord. He also included it in the Ten Commandments at Sinai, writing it in stone to show us that this would be a permanent commandment. As long as, you know, as man is man, living in the situation in which we're in, we will always owe God worship. And so we need time in which to do that. From then on, it continued to be God's will. There's no question about that. God often rebuked Israel and Judah for breaking the Sabbath. They were not worshiping Him. They were not honoring Him. But of course, there's no, I don't think there's really any serious question about that. The real question is, does it continue in, in the new covenant, right? After Christ completed His work. You know, how do we know Paul's not including the Sabbath in what we read this morning about, you know, one person regards every day alike? Well, first of all, we do need to recognize that our need to worship the Lord certainly hasn't changed, okay? When Jesus fulfilled everything that the old covenant was pointing to and He freed us from our guilt and condemnation, He certainly did not free us from our obligation to worship. And certainly we see the early church worshiping Him. He strengthened that obligation because now we are redeemed. Not that the Old Testament believers weren't, but now we see the redemption that God has provided in Christ. Neither has our need to have a day in common been abolished. We still need a day in common to meet together so we can do what the author to the Hebrews uh, tells us we must do. In chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, he says, let us con consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. It, they are having trouble even in those days, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, this day drawing near, remember how Paul was talking about a day drawing near and how we needed to put off the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light? I believe the day that the author to the Hebrews was referring to here was the day when the types and shadows were all going to be destroyed. 70 AD was just around the corner. This book, I believe, was written in, in around 68 uh, AD. So he is saying, let's meet together. Let's encourage one another because God's judgment is coming. We need to be able to stand. Now, besides these practical reasons that we still need to worship, we still need to have a day in common, we're explicitly told, first of all, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant prophets, that the Sabbath would continue into the New Covenant. The Lord says through Isaiah that when the New Covenant had come, that those who kept the Sabbath would be singled out for God's blessing. That's quite interesting. We read in Isaiah 56, verses 4 through 7, For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial, and a name better than that of sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Now, this time, is, what's remarkable about this is the fact that eunuchs and foreigners were excluded from God's congregation. Uh, in the Old Covenant. So what he's referring to here is a time when they would be included. And that time is the time of the New Covenant. The New Covenant is when eunuchs and foreigners are included. And we see that happening in the book of Acts, you know, with the Ethiopian eunuch. And there was significance to that. It was fulfilling prophecy. And also when the Lord begins to gather not just the God-fearing Gentiles, but also the Samaritans and the, you know, the nations uh, to himself, the foreigner. Well, the eunuchs and foreigners who keep his Sabbaths will, un will be uniquely blessed. 
The psalmist tells us in Psalm 118, verses 22 through 24, which we read for our meditation, that the day that Christ would be raised from the dead would be a day of rejoicing for the church. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And you know, when we read the New Testament, we find that's exactly what New Covenant believers did. They met together on this day, the day that Christ rose from the dead for worship. Now, in our passage, I've already mentioned, Jesus tells us that the Sabbath continues by declaring himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. He says the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus didn't say the Sabbath is going to pass away. You're not going to need it anymore. But he says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath and I give it to you to be a blessing for you as God originally intended. You know, not to be a day of burden, to make life hard for you, but to be a day of blessing because it's a day where you get to spend with the one whom you love the most. He told his disciples in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, in light of the judgment that was going to fall on the Jews in 70 AD when Jerusalem would be destroyed, which was a full 40 years beyond the establishing of the new covenant, the death and resurrection of Christ, that they should pray that their flight out of the country, which Jesus told them to be ready for, would not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, which is telling us that Jesus expected the Sabbath still to be observed by his disciples in 70 AD, which is clearly beyond the establishing of the new covenant. The author to the Hebrews argues that the Sabbath day continues because Jesus completed his work and entered into his rest in Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 10. So there remains a Sabbath for the people of God, a Sabbath rest, the day of rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest, who is Christ, has himself also rested from his works as God did from his the author to the Hebrews also tells us that the blessing of the new covenant is the writing of the law on our hearts, giving us the love and the power to keep them. Remember, the, the author to the Hebrews is simply quoting Jeremiah 31, I believe it is, when he says, they, the Jews, did not continue in my covenant. They continually broke my commandments, and so I did not care for them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I am going to make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The law that Israel didn't keep, which were the Ten Commandments, is the law that God in the new covenant is going to write on the hearts of his people so that they would love him enough actually to keep those commandments, and those commandments include the Sabbath. The new covenant fixes the flaw with the old covenant, which is the law was written on stone, and that couldn't give them the power to keep it. But when it's written on your heart by the Spirit, you can. The only change that God has made to the day is the day in which it is to be observed. In the old covenant, the Sabbath was celebrated on, on two, for two different grounds. The first was the day that God finished his work of creation and entered into his rest. The second is when he brought Israel out of Egypt. Okay? Creation, and you might say a picture of the new creation. Um, so the old, the old Covenant Sabbath was based on that, and in both cases it was observed on the seventh day of the week. But the New Covenant Sabbath, or the Lord's Day, is celebrated on the first day of the week because this is the day that Jesus completed the work of the new creation and entered into his rest when he rose from the dead. All things are made new in Christ. The old creation was destroyed by sin. Jesus makes all things new again. And to commemorate that, the day of his resurrection is the day that the church met together for worship. Now, all of this is to say that Paul cannot be referring to the Sabbath, you know, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, when he says that we have the liberty either to keep it or not keep it. 
he must be referring to the feast days of the Jewish calendar because the Sabbath is a part of God's continuing moral standard. Okay? So that's the first point. Sabbath continues. There's really no question about that. Secondly, I just want us to consider briefly how the Lord wants us to keep the Sabbath. And again, very briefly here. He tells us in the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, everything we need to know, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's really all you need to know. But he goes on to say, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. How do we keep the Sabbath? How do we keep this commandment? By keeping that day holy. What does that mean? It means to set it apart from all the other days. Anything that's holy belongs to God. That day we are set apart as belonging to God. How do we do that? Well, we make sure we get all of our work done on the other six days so that we don't have to work on His day so that we can devote that day to Him and spend it with Him. Now, this commandment also tells us that we need to make sure that we let other people rest as well by not making them work for us. Because this commandment really applies to everyone. All the commandments apply to everyone. What is it that people are going to be judged, the, the goats, what are they going to be judged by on the day of judgment? The commandments, okay? That tells us what sin is. So this is one of those commandments that they're going to be judged for is not worshiping God on His day. So we are to let Others rest on this day as well so that we can all spend the day with the Lord in worship. You know, they're, they're not going to worship the Lord anyway, but that doesn't mean that we should make them work so that they can't do it. We need to give them the opportunity to do it. So we need that day. We all need that day to worship, and we need it to fellowship. And remember, Jesus gives us two exceptions of what may be done on that day. We may do work that's necessary such as the disciples did by picking the heads of grain and feeding themselves. Uh, we can prepare food and we can feed ourselves. We can attend to our personal hygiene. You know, that would be a good thing, especially if we're getting together. And we can do works of mercy, right? Jesus said on another occasion, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said that in the context of healing a man whose hand was withered and also healing a man who, who was crippled on that day. We can show mercy to others. We can, we can do good to them, okay? Uh, which is why doctors and nurses, police officers, firemen, and people who do other types of necessary work can work on that day, but let's not forget the day is meant to be God's day, and they shouldn't be working all the time on that day. They owe God worship. Now, finally and most importantly, why do we need this day? Well, we've already seen that we need rest. If we continually work nonstop, we're eventually going to kill ourselves, destroy our health, which is a violation of the Sixth Commandment. But we also need worship. We need to worship. Sometimes we think God commands us to worship Him because He needs the worship. God doesn't need the worship. He, he didn't have to create us. He, he didn't need a people to worship Him. He didn't need a people to see His glory and praise Him for it. He was perfectly happy before He did any of these things. He has everything that He needs in Himself, all blessedness. The reason why He commands us to worship Him is because we need worship. We need it. We need time in His presence. We need to hear His Word. We need to learn about Him we need to draw near to Him. This is how we become spiritually stronger. This is how we grow. This is how we become more blessed, more happy. 
more assured, and so more useful because God is our good. He is the source of all of our comfort and all of our blessing. The nearness of God is our good, and we don't draw near to Him any, anywhere else more so than here when we meet together for worship. And by the way, that is the reason why there is such a struggle to come to church on Sunday. I mean, there's not a struggle going to the store. There's no struggle usually going to places that we want to go to to do things we'd like to do, but there, there is warfare going on when it comes to coming to church because the devil, the world, and our flesh don't want us to come here. They work over time to try to keep us away from spending time with God and drawing near to Him because worship is their enemy. Worship makes us stronger and better able to resist them. And they know that when we fall away from worship, we begin our downward spiral into sin. You know, how does it usually begin when people fall away from the Lord? It usually starts with we don't see them in worship. And eventually we don't see them at all because they've fallen away from the Lord. God wants us to be blessed. God wants us to be joyful. He wants us to be assured. He wants us to be spiritually strong. He wants us to put on His Son and make no room in our lives for the flesh but to put it to death. And He knows that we can only do this if we draw near to Him. And knowing us much better than we know ourselves, He knows that unless He appoints a day where we do this, we likely are not going to do this. And so He gives us this day. If we want that blessing He intends for us, we need to keep it. Let me just close with the words of the Lord through Isaiah, where he pronounces a blessing on those who keep the Sabbath day. Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. There is a blessing in keeping the Sabbath day. By not using the day for what we want to do, you know, the reason why churches today have e Saturday evening worship is so that the members of the church can take the day and use it for what they want to use it for. But the Lord is telling us that we need to use it for His pleasure and not ours. And really, we should find our pleasure in meeting with Him and with His people on this day. If we do that, He will bless us with the blessings, not the old covenant blessings, but the blessings of the new covenant, a greater fullness of his presence and his, his joy and his pleasure through the Holy Spirit. Well, let's, uh, let's take just a moment, shall we, and bow in prayer and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to help us do this.